righty. And we are soon to be live. All right, we are live on YouTube. Right. And folks are coming on in. Hello, hello. We'll just give it a minute or two more for people to find their way in. Hi, Alice. Hi, Dan. Hi, Lorna. Hello, Britt. And if anybody wants, as usual, to let us know where you're calling from, yeah, tell us where you are right now. Our well country. Cool. Just a little south. Just a little south. Mm. Indiana's more than a little south. <laughs> a little northwest, a little northeast, depending on where you want to go. Just pop <clears throat> this YouTube link up on Twitter for anybody who wanted to join from there. We'll just give it one more moment for folks to come on in and then we'll get started. Okay. What a world country. All righty. Well, just the, the usual housekeeping announcements. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's final session on day eight of the Festival of Indigenous Languages. Thanks for being here with us. We, uh, as usual, are recording and streaming this session. So just be aware that if you ask a question, your name might appear in the recording. Keep that in mind. Uh, and as usual, we really encourage you to ask any questions you might have, share your own experiences, share your thoughts with the speaker. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Jesse Hodgetts to introduce our speaker today. Yeah, my God, I'm Jesse Hodgetts. I'm a Ngampa man, which is Western New South Wales, um, Australia, um, and also from the University of Newcastle. Um, I'd like to introduce um, friend, work colleague, cultural mentor, Dr. Raymond Kelly, Dungari Gumbengi man, who's doing really important um, language recovery work in a, in a space where um, a lot of our connections have been forcibly cut through government policy. So um, today is really vital time for us to, in our language recovery work. So um, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Ray Kelly. Good morning, everybody. And Jesse, thank you very much for the um, introduction this morning. Um, I've got a presentation uh, that I'm going to do because it's a, um, I'd heard uh, this morning that when sometimes when you when you can't get your stream of thought happening, images do work. So I'm going to to do that as well. Um, I just wanted to uh, say thank you to the organisers and uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be a part of this important conversation. Um, much of my work uh, today is about trying to build conversation because uh, that is the, the real opportunity for uh, our recovery. Um, people who work in isolation um, can benefit from, from um, you know, sharing with each other. So I'm about to share my screen and this is the presentation I'll try and move through quickly so that we've got time to have a bit of a chat. Is that right? Have I got that right? Now I just need to hit the from the beginning, I think. Okay. 
So again, uh, you know, I'm very pleased to be a part of this conversation uh, about Indigenous languages um, and obviously across the world, uh, the challenges that we face uh, um, and also talking about some of the, the really important work that we're doing. Um, there's an image here in the background of a program called Muyabangi, uh, and I'll unpack um, what Muyabangi actually means through the presentation. Uh, the word comes from, or the two words come from, uh, the construction of a word for a telephone uh, described by my grandfather. And so um, through the presentation, you'll see him uh, and we can then talk more. So let me go. Do I enter? Yes. Okay. So quickly, friends, uh, this is uh, who I am and where I've come from, uh, or who I am today. Dangati Guri, Gumengi Guri, now working at the University of Newcastle, uh, was able to uh, find my way back into the education system after a long layoff. Um, well, a very small beginning to start with, and then um, found myself in enrolled in a PhD here at the University of Newcastle and uh, framed up a conversation, is the way that I see it, around this uh, idea of the word dreaming the kipara. And um, when I began... The, uh, when I began the, the thesis, I really didn't have much of an idea about how it would finalise, but I knew that it would had something to do with the gathering. So the, the notion of the word kipara means those who are gathered. So the idea of dreaming for a kipara is the is this sense of wanting to reinvigorate and uh, create the critical thinking uh, and a critical thinking space for us. Uh, the dates, 1808 to 2007, will not become as in, uh, clear here today, but I may find a way to help you understand what those dates mean as we move through. So I need to go back and start at the beginning. So this is my community in uh, Armadale on the eastern, eastern, eastern aspects of the Armadale community. Um, my family had returned to the area in the uh, mid 50s, uh, mid 1950s, and this is the um, this is the life conditions that they had to endure in that period of time. To understand the New England area, which is where Armadale is situated, it's a very cold um, climate. Uh, and so for my community to have to live through these conditions uh, during that period of time, it was very difficult. Uh, to the bottom left bottom of the, the screen is my grandmother and my grandfather. Funnily enough, though, it's my grandfather on my father's side and my grandmother on my mother's side. Now, that's, a, that's an interesting um, uh, image, but it's... It just shows the, the conditions that some of our communities and many of the communities in Australia had to live through uh, during the period of uh, isolation and uh, removal. Here is uh, the image, uh, another image almost on uh, adjacent to the, to the old rubbish dump in 1960-61, um, uh, following the, a number of tragic deaths of young people and uh, young children in particular, um, the government was forced uh, to provide service, uh, provide living, um, living uh, support for our people. And so 14 little cottages were built in that space. Um, whole big ceremony about key handover and obviously the government wanting to see the to to show that they were actually doing some th good things for our community um, predominantly in this uh, community at this time the the, the the two dominant languages Dangati and Wumbangi were uh, being freely communicated amongst our older people 
and um, you know our, our, we children uh, grew up with uh, a sense of some of that language and uh, um, but obviously uh, the influence or the um, the dominant positioning of the welfare board at that time made it very difficult this is the year this is the period of assimilation um, probably the most dominant uh, assimilation uh, for our people um, following on from the removal of children uh, in in the for a preceding uh, generation An important character, and in fact, two important people uh, were Frank and Sarah Archibald. These are my grandparents, my great grandparents, um, and uh, they were they were very much the uh, what the the glue that kept our community together. And, and indeed, Frank Archibald um, was considered a very important man across a, a broad range of areas. Um, he was born in 1884 um, and he died in 1975. So I was 14 years of age when he passed. Uh, and so we, we had this, um, this sense of continued cultural knowledge um, faced or, um, up against the, 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 um, the positioning of the assimilation policies that were very much active in in this East Armidale area. Lots of us children were going from the community into town to, to receive teaching, uh, education, schooling. Um, and so this sense of uh, dying culture, the loss of a culture was, was, quite, um, was quite heavy for, for, for children in that period of time. Moving through to about 1975, so Frank died in 1975, uh, my great grandfather. Um, but in that year prior to his death, the establishment, on, the establishment by the National Parks and Wildlife Service of a um, sites of significant survey uh, program for trying to capture those knowledges that were held by traditional uh, knowledge holders. Uh, was very important. And so my father, my late father, Raymond Lewis Kelly, and his colleague, Howard Creamer, uh, on the bottom left, uh, were very instrumental in establishing uh, this program in the state of New South Wales. And what they were able to do was work and uh, with senior knowledge holders and to capture uh, their details around sites of significance, um, language, um, connection stories. And this is on the, um, and so it was very important at that pe period of time. And when I talk about the notion of genuine consultation, one of the things that, one of the most important aspects of, that uh, Raymond Lewis <coughs> and <coughs> Howard Cream, excuse me, had uh, begun to do was to, provide people with proper recognition for their for their information to pay them accordingly to to pay them as consultants not as throwing a few bob to to um, people who might know things so centering traditional knowledge holders as uh, a key uh, in the investigation of, <clears throat> of cultural heritage was very important in this period of time the, another program that was established in this period was um, uh, a boys to 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 the bush, uh, boys to men's program, and so uh, we were um, a number of us children, or young boys at that time, were were taken out into traditional areas by these old men and given insight into not just the the cultural aspects, but also the the movement of white Australia. And the destruction of culture, and the uh, and another aspect was the imposition of, of how the knowledge was being correlated and 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 put together. And one of the things that they were talking about was 
returning material to the community so that those people who were interviewed might tell you whether or not you actually had the information correct to then maybe expand on the information. But this is primarily the, the role of, of gathering knowledge in that period of time, people making, um, you know, whirlwinds sweeps through, through country, talking to people um, and often never returning. And so when we're talking about language today, for me, this is a, this is a very important aspect about how do we find a way to investigate the language or languages. <clears throat> Um, my great grandmother, uh, uh, my sorry, my grandmother and my grandfather are on the right hand side, and so the word Muyabungi means flying breath, and it I attributed it's attributed to my grandfather uh, Leonard uh, de Silva. But I also want to talk about the notion of that creative language, and so on the left hand side, uh, this little quote: "The rain fell like one thing." Uh, for me, the image of a heavy downpouring of his rain was was typical of the the creative languages uh, my grandmother and her sisters and, and and brothers were using at that time. So when we think about language, we for for lots of people it's about a traditional language, but for me it's that insightful creative use of words. You know, the rain falling like one thing. Uh, and there are many, many aspects of that. Now, my colleague, uh, Jesse, uh, is on the left, and I'm about to show you a little clip, if you don't mind. You've got to share sound. Um, so when you share the screen, you've got to click the bottom left, tick the bottom left, box that says share sound and then you'll actually oh, I got I got no idea. It's Not right. that one. No when Not you share one? your screen when you share your zoom screen. No I haven't got an idea. That's all right. You can't hear that well if you know how to unshare and reshare you can click the bottom left corner that says um, share sound. But if okay. Not all right. We might need to leave it there. But yeah, uh, all right. so it's a tricky little song, a catchy little song that Jesse uh, put together for me, which is, and I want to give some credit to Jesse uh, here, credit um, uh, recognition, uh, big thanks. I had this idea and it's been, it's been coming for quite a while. And I sent out to Jesse and said, look, can you, um, can you put together uh, a song for me, uh, uh, some music around this song? And so what came back from this is a, was a critical, was a very uplifting little um, uh, ditty, I suppose, uh, that talks about critical particles of language. And the, so the word iri, urri, arri uh, was the, the sense of the song. Uh, I'm going to have to sing it. Uh, maybe you can help me, Jesse. Yeah, go on. Okay. Iri um, uri are, iri uri are, this doing that, this doing that. Iri uri are, iri uri are, this doing that, this thing doing. So basically what it is is this important parts of language, iri uri are. Uh, and what I was trying to get to here was this sense of how these particles fit on the end of words um, and so for me when I when I began to to do this language work I started by yeah I looked at the dictionaries um, I then started to think what do I remember as a child do I remember these things and what I started to realize what there are sounds that are made that weren't captured in the way that I needed for them to be they were being captured and framed in an English uh, word ending at times. Often sounds that were, were, were being described didn't quite sound the way that I'd record, remembered the old fellow, my great-grandfather and grandfather, actually sitting down talking. So anyway, we'll keep trying to work through this so that we might get to 
um, get to the end so that you'll understand what some of this means. So as I said, coming into the language space with community knowledge um, and, and finding ways to interact with these historical written resources, that was my challenge. How do I begin to start to make sense of what it is that the, that's being articulated here? Because it, for me, it looked, it looked bound. It sounded bound. And so when I was looking through historical documents, then trying to work through those recorded sound files, great, great challenges. As I said, language comes to us in a multitude of ways, but merely interfacing with the written documentation will not guarantee our success in our rebuilding efforts. We need to work with neighbouring language groups and we need to build relationships with other First Nations linguists. When I say this, I mean that there are nuances and, and ways of communicating in our languages that are just not the same way as they're described on paper. Now, when I'm listening to, to sound files, it's been, I've been at it for almost 20 years now. And so this, this deep, um, this skill of listening has, has heightened dramatically um, over the years. And this is where I call this thing from. Uh, and I, I talk about it as having an ear in both camps. Now, not, not everybody has uh, these, um, not everybody can come to this in the same way, but you could, we can all come from it in those, in those two different ways. Those are the things that are being said in our communities, those family and community knowledges that are still very much a part of our lives, still communicated and, token, and spoken about. Um, you can listen to old people. And so you don't, uh, you know, in, in Australia, we've got uh, thousands and thousands of hours of recording. And so you can also begin to listen to those recordings um, and start to interpret and work through there. As I said, that notion of storytelling is very much still a part of our community, that creative use of language. Um, so even when we're talking amongst ourselves, when we say things, most people will think that we're saying something else, but there is a there is a nuance that is that is typically uh, guri. Understanding those traditional educational frameworks um, and, and trying to find a way to get back to those those principles that we are really talking about First Nations mindsets that we're talking about. Um, the historical impositions and the real and the and the movement of our people out of the education system, but that multilingualism is the key to for, is the key to the language work for me, because we do understand those nuances. For lots of people working in the academic knowledges, it's a it's a minefield. You know, it, how do I how do I begin to get into that space? How do I how do I make uh, a position, give a position. How do I begin to um, begin to make a difference? Well, for me, it's important that we are in the academic space. That we do uh, that we do uh, challenge. Uh, that we do share up knowledge. Uh, that we do try to extend that knowledge base. And there is a critical thinking that's very important for us, and we need to begin to start to do that. So. Again, I'm going to lead into a linguistic uh, analysis, but it will be very, very small towards the end of this. This is where we are today at the Wallatooka Institute. It's a, uh, it's a Ubiut place with lots of First Nations people, First uh, Peoples working here. Uh, we're trying to develop our own um, intellectual inquiry. Uh, we're trying to bring younger people into the space and we're trying to uh, we're trying to help support their their endeavours in their communities in a broad range of ways. But when I talk about language, I talk about these mechanics and this musicology of language. To articulate words on paper and then to try and bring them back into fluid use oh, is very difficult unless you understand particularly what each of those little pieces are doing. So when you draw from a, from a database, you then 
you then have to follow what is what is layered for you. So, you know, I when I talk about this, I talk about the how, the sound, the way, the pronunciation of language, and the and the relationship interfacing with those other language databases. Now, for many of us, it's a challenge in in our communities because people go, "We're different," but why are we different? What makes us different? If uh, and so that's a challenge going forward. What makes us different? What are the? But for for many of us today, those people who are actively be getting involved in language today, we're all seeing these relationships. We're all starting to say, "Oh, hang on, we've got those bits too. We've got those particles. We've got that those um, those vowels and that nouns." So really, it's about building good relationships and having more conversations, sharing. Being critical, allowing the the notion of critical thinking to be okay. It's all right. When you think about our language and our culture being uh, shaped and driven by specifically non-Aboriginal Australia, and not just non-Aboriginal Australia, but but non-Aboriginal people, retrieving that retrieving that mantle and and taking responsibility is often very difficult. But it's not it's not something we can't overcome. So we've got to build better. We've got to build better opportunities, and we've also got to build the skill base. So when I work through when I work through the sound files and then the recorded material, I break it down into its bits. And sometimes when I can understand a word, uh, when I can hear a word. I have to go to each of the points of the of the of the sound file and listen through it. So I make a I make an example for the for the rhotic sound. That's the trill sound in our communities, uh, and 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 I argue that basically they're the same. Whether they're fricatized sound, or whether they're tapped art, art, art. For me, those 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 rhotic sounds are the same in terms of the trill. So the example is the word "wirrai" opposed to "willai," "wirrai" opposed to "willai," and so there are many many examples of the, of of these sounds and these recordings as we move through the language work. Um, and so when I talk about my little song that Jesse created for me. Uh, this, I call it "You Trill Me," um, uh, but it, for me, it's about making a case for this trill as being a dynamic piece of uh, artistry from 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 the toolbox. Yeah. So either side of a trill is a vowel, and each of those vowels, for me, have a very important place. So when I go back to my community and I go back to my childhood, and I hear the old people sing out "Ah," there, hear that? What they've done is they've told. I now know that what they were doing was that they were telling me that the word "Ah" means there, because they 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 supported that "Ah," there, hear that? And so that's what I've been finding now is. This is how to how to work through the language. So when I break down a sentence, I break it into its first bits. What is its first bit? What is that second bit? And what is that last bit or other bits? Now, linguists tell us it's about subject, order, verb, and sometimes that works. But what about free flow? Doesn't our language? Doesn't our community? Would our communities not have had free flow? That is the, the the ability to 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 use language in a creative myriad of creative ways. So when I first talk about the first bit, it's not always a pronoun. It's not always about him, her, or them. Sometimes it's about the action. The second bit um, usually is this doing or that that doing thing, which is that iri or riari thing that we talk about. And the last bit sometimes is the is the is the verb, and then the other bits follow on behind. But I'm going to give you some examples about how to do that. 
So here is a series of questions uh, raised by a linguist called Janet Bolt to, um, um, to one of our senior language uh, speakers. And so she asks these questions um, one after the other. Um, and obviously it's to do with the word water. So when we start to look through the, sorry, it's water and drink. Um, so when we start to look through the, the, the piece as it works, we then have to work through it. So if I just say, if I just tell you, if he says, if he has a drink, he will feel better. So at pace, it sounds something different to what's here. So we end up with the word gen as opposed to gen. We end up with marung as opposed to marung. Marung gen. Uh, the next one, if he has a drink, he won't be th thirsty. Irno, this do, nambe irtra, drink this there, atn, irno, this do, gugra uru beirn, irn weir, weir, So his throat won't be dry. <laughs> Uh, which is so understanding that when we're talking about thirsty, we, we don't, you can't translate thirsty because we don't have thirsty. What it, we, we have is we have the throat is not dry. He will drink water now. So it becomes the him is the P and or the B either way. Uh, he this do uh, drink uh, this now. He this do water. He this in sorry. He's into the water now. Now there's a difference between consume ngam and the word in ngam. So there's a slight variation on on this creative language here. But what they're actually saying is into the water now, meaning you know. I can see him, he's into the water. Lady Ree will drink some water. So the word guri means um, man, woman, child, uh, family, um, people. So, the, so it becomes an important part. Another one, he's, he is drinking some water now. Yori, meaning now, yornyara arnbirtura, arnbirtura. He does not drink water. Irnoa woir, garnbiri, woirnan. He's always drinking. Arnbiri, gurara, guri. And the word gurara actually means longer. It means to extend something, to make something longer. So the creative use of language here isn't merely about translating it into English. And this is the challenge. How do we then begin to understand each of the important pieces? So when we talk about the notion of being dry, what's dry? The throat's dry. Gugra. Gugra is dry. So literally, you're not dry, but your throat's dry. So those are the challenges that I see working through the, the language uh, space. And one of the things that we're trying to come up with is, is this creative um, use of imagery. And I'm working with a colleague here, Kaylee, who's assisting me. So being able to articulate that we're talking about first bits, second bits, last bits, other bits, as opposed to subject, order, verb, removing the linguistic terminology as best we can, drawing it back into our community language so that we can then go, oh, okay, I can understand you. Because the people that we're actually trying to return this language to, many of them, many of them didn't, didn't do well at school. And in fact, uh, that's a challenge. How do we then... Not it's not it's not um, dumbing it down. It's just about finding the appropriate language, uh, and that's about it in terms of the the uh, the, the the presentation. I'm it's I'm never I'm never comfortable that I've said enough, but perhaps sometimes it's not about saying anything at all. So there we go. Yeah, great. Um, now there's a lot to talk about there. Thank you, Dr. Raymond Kelly. Um, just 
Um, so we're open to questions now. Um, I might, uh, I'll open up the first question actually. Um, I think at the start there, you really established your presentation with your old people and, and it grounded it and gave it context, um, contextualizing the data, I guess, um, at your old people. So how important do you think in a language recovery space, how important do you think lineage to your old people is? I, I think it's absolutely critical. Um, a, to, to justify where you come from to, to begin with, to pay homage to your, to your existence, and then to start to realise those things that have passed through you, whether it be, you know, the way the old people talk or whether they've said something to you or the way in which they've described something. So those nuances I talk about, those cultural frameworks come from somewhere. And often we, we, we think it's about, we think it's, a, it's about the, the, the important knowledge of place and, 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 and settings. But sometimes it's about removal. Sometimes it's about I didn't have that. I didn't have that at the time. But as you dig a little bit deeper, then things are starting to reveal. So it's about paying respect there. But it's also about justifying where you're coming from and saying, this is where I get my material from. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you dig a little deeper, that's right. I've, I've been through the same things where you, you think you have nothing. There's no cultural knowledge here. There's nothing left. But then when you actually really go deep and you think about the things your grandmother or your grandfather said to you and you really think about them, you realise there's a whole lot there. Um, as I know in my context anyway. Um, have you got any questions coming through, even from um, I think there was you, the YouTube stream? Might have had questions. Was there any there? Oh, yeah, just have one supportive comment. Oh, great. Somebody yes. Can't wait for this yarn. So uh, I think it's Sarah Jane Siri. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm interested to know your language recovery and revitalization to members of your community who are deaf um, or hard of hearing. How do you help them get back to their language? Mm -hmm. Um, interestingly, we do have a colleague here at the University of Newcastle who has been working in this area, and he was a part of our Muyabungi Symposium, uh, which we had two years ago. Unfortunately, COVID has knocked us around a little bit, um, and perhaps we can send on the details of that work. But I think it's absolutely critical that that we, we start to think about um, sign language and, and other ways to communicate, because that's... That's, in fact, the way in which we communicate in our communities. Many of us are talking with our lips. Many of us are talking with our heads. Uh, and so there is another language um, gift and skill there that is right amongst our communities. Um, but we can share um, Rodney, um, Rodney's um, um, details around some of the work that he's doing. But very much... Um, very much thinking about that as well. That's always been in our in our mindset that we should be communicating with everybody. Mm, yeah, and the hand talk was so important as something that didn't get as recorded because of uh, the lack of video resources at the time, mm. unfortunately. So that suffered a lot more. So it's definitely an area we need people to pick up on. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And still, obviously, amongst our communities, you know, um, you know, what's that? Um, you know, there is this, there is sign language that's still very much in our money. Is that any money? Mm. <laughs> um, and that's paper money. Paper money, yeah. <laughs> not not gold, not rock. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, all right, another question from Britt Jacobson. Those examples of creative use of words or phrases like it rained like one thing, are some of the most interesting parts of language. It's fantastic you've been able to discover these in the recordings. Have you created any of your own? Good question. Um, I think I, I think I do it every every time I talk. I think I try to find ways to to use that creative language, um, particularly, and and I find that I'll do it. I'll do it when I'm amongst my my family. We will talk about. Um, um, we will talk about things like um, um, 
Uh, she broke her neck to get down there. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? So she was yeah. excited. She was, yeah. but to break a neck to get down there, that's, that's really, yeah, that's uh, extreme. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, and that's probably a lot. Once again, another thing that suffered the creative language use, because you talked about the assimilation period um, into the sixties and obviously recording language into cultural outsiders is going to um, assimilate the language documentation to actually compromise some of that um, creative use as well. So I guess also, um, you know, how do we get back to that, that, in, that allowing that creative use of language as well in our language recovery? Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, and, and obviously working in, in this digital space, is, it's a real challenge, um, but it is an opportunity for us to, to quickly get people together, um, as you know, through the Muyabungi program, we you know the the most distant student was from Melbourne. Um, so what are we talking? A couple of thousand kilometres away. Um, so we can get together. Um, we can get together um, quickly, but I also think it's about creating um, lines of th inquiry and lines of thinking. So if we if we said that we wanted to work specifically in that creative language use and, and we did some research specifically around that, then what what might come from that is this body of work that says, okay, how is that framed? How is that framed? Is it is it merely just to uh, is it merely just to be you know humorous language or is it in fact uh, is there a, is there a, a traditional cultural cultural grounding for that in the linguistic space? traditional linguistic space I kind of think it has to have because when we think about the databases the databases are um, um, you know they're, they're broad but they don't have all the words so what do we do when we come up with a word for something you know for um, well obviously if we're going to yeah, you know, for the song that we talk about with the two up, you know, well, it is, it's two up. Now, I don't know if everybody in the world knows, but we play a game in Australia called two up, which is played with a, um, a piece of stick and two pennies and we spin them in the air. <coughs> and when they land, if they land on uh, particularly the old days, the kangaroo's tails, that was called tails and the other one was head. So basically... Um, it was a game that, um, um, you know, that, and it still it still occurs here in Australia on, um, what is it, Anzac Day. The, it's all Australians get together for a game of two-up. Well, you know, we have a song that's been recorded uh, from uh, Victoria right through to Queensland, three and, and, and a multitude of all, multitude of variations to that one song. And so thinking about, how that creative language uses, uh, you know, it, it's there and the opportunities are, are, are there for us. I think the, as we move forward, we, we've got to be thinking specifically about working in each of those areas and developing research around that. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's funny that you, that last example you just gave about the two up being across such a large area, Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland. Like, I, I don't know if that's the equivalent of, you know, over a thousand kilometres or for the Americans, you guys do the maths for miles. But um, And then so defining language group names can also be a challenge because everyone's explaining or describing to up their own way, yep. describing it their own way. Um, and, and perhaps that isn't strict language, type language groups, but perhaps that's the way that maybe that family describes to up, you know. Um, mm. Mm. And that's another thing today. What do we do today when a lot of those uh, language definitions or language group names are not quite known, but we're all, we've all been dispossessed, dislocated into different country and we're now different family groups speaking different ways, but we've got to understand each other as well, mm. you know. Yeah. And look, I think that the, the rebuilding efforts will be, will be led by communities. They make their own decisions. Yeah. But I would say don't be don't be fearful of doing anything. 
because all you're doing is describing something, mm-hmm. you know. So you know, I mean, if we if we if we talk about somebody that's loud, we just say he's all neck, mm-hmm. you know, he's all neck that fella, meaning, <laughs> you know, he's just. We don't say throat; we say neck, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> which is which is bizarre. But anyway, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. so that's creative languages. Yeah. Is there any other questions coming through? I've got a question, actually, if, if I might. Yep. Yeah, I was really it, struck by, by your description of having an ear in both camps. I love that, that framing. And mm. as somebody coming from the academic camp, I guess I'm wondering what you're hoping to see places like universities and other institutions that might hold materials doing in, in during the international decade of indigenous languages, what, what kind of contributions you're hoping to see from them? Mm. Can I just, um, first of all, thank you for the question, but also to, to indicate that I'm a part of the, um, the uh, New South Wales Aboriginal Languages Trust. And so we're, you know, we're doing some really important things um, around supporting language revitalization in communities. But for me, the the interaction with with uh, the academy is very important. So thinking about the way in which uh, this, the vast majority of these recordings are held at um, at the Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies in Canberra, how how can we help support the the recovery of that? Uh, uh, you know, the retrieval of that into the communities. Now they've got their own programs and they're they're very good at it. But to excite people about this, uh, about this, inf- about this detail, um, and then also to, to for me, for me, it's about a, a first people's linguistic um, space. Um, you know, the Australian Linguistic Society will uh, is doing what it can to support Indigenous involvement, but I really think it's important that what we're talking about is purely from an Indigenous space. Yes, it's academic. And yes, it can begin to start to, to interface and I- interact with that other, those other, other groups. But we have to drive it. We have to be the drivers. We have to be the people who shape that. We have to create the kipara. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, being in different spaces everywhere um, as Aboriginal people. Um, there's just more information in the chat about the New South Wales Aboriginal Languages Trust there. Um, ah, great. Another question um, coming from YouTube stream. Um, now, I might pronounce this properly because it's in written language. We know the limitations of written language. But hi, I'm from Jeju Island, Korea. How much documentation has been done in your community? What do you do with recordings? Are there any challenges or successful stories in terms of documenting? Um, there has been probably what we would consider maybe between 30 and 40 hours of recordings in what we're calling Dangati space. Um, but there are neighbouring languages with um, also with other recordings. And so while, whilst we think that there, it's a very limited um, resource. In fact, it's, it's, there's a great deal of material in it. Um, so what we're doing with the recordings today is we, we are transcribing them from our perspective, um, but I also share them. Uh, the one thing that I do is uh, with the digital space nowadays is we don't have to have tape recorders. All of those, um, all of that material has now been, you know, analogued or move to to a to a different format just drop off people a, a stick of um, you know memory stick with the language on here it is this is yours have a listen uh, don't fight with them over what you think you know and they know just give it mm. and when you and when you give it then what what they have is they have an opportunity to interface from their perspective and then maybe they come back and they talk to you Nobody knows everything. That's the one thing that I, I've come to understand in, in this language situation. Nobody knows everything. But in talking to others, you might learn something else. Um, 
um, and, and look, there are there are in growing um, success stories everywhere. Every day we're, we're seeing somebody come up with a new way of doing something or, or somebody coming up with a, a new little book for their children or their their community. So all of this all of this all of this these outputs are very, very important. They're critical to recovery. Um, and so the, at the very heart of where we're at, if you're into, if you're doing any language work, it doesn't matter. Do it, create it in your community. Hold on to the things that you know in your own own family, and then begin to start to work from there. And we can grow these. And there are lots of great stories um, in New South Wales, and particularly along the north coast of New South Wales, um, as there is elsewhere in the, in the state. Um, the the Murrabai Aboriginal um, Language Centre are doing fantastic things. Uh, the Dungati um, language space is now starting to to really begin to fire up. Um, there's a recovery effort in Anuwan language on the on the uh, northern um, New England tablelands. Um, so there's work happening everywhere. Um, we just have to begin to start to to embrace it, support it. And begin to own it, and because when we start to do that, then we can we can we can expand from there. But we can't do it if we if we if we if we're fearful of it, um, if we're frightened of making mistakes. As somebody who has made a million mistakes in the process in in the time that I've spent in this, I say don't worry about it. Don't worry about making mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. I've done it. If I could, if I could show you the translations that I've made over the last fifteen years, from one year to the next, people would be amazed. They'd say, think that there were two different people doing that, maybe even three different people. But but as as you get better at it, particularly from here to the, to the mouth, as you begin to get better at at at, under, at moving the 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 word and the sound and the the shape in your mouth, the better you'll get at it. And in fact, it actually helps you understand more. Yeah. Um, if there's no more questions, I think that's a really good finish because um, it's plenty of places yeah. to look forward to from here on in, um, in all the activities that are happening in our language space here. So um, thank you, Dr. Raymond Kelly. Um, and we'll pass it back over to Anna. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. It was an honor to hear from you today. There was a lot of good thank learning you. there. And thank yeah. you also, Jesse, for making the time to, to host this. Hey, happy to be here. It was good. Great listening. And uh, thank you all. Oh, sorry, Dr. Kelly. I was about to wave. <laughs> yeah, let's all, let's all have a virtual round of applause for Dr. Kelly. And thank you very much, you guys, for helping. Thanks, Jesse. And Have thank you all. We hope you can join us tomorrow for our next talk uh, from Dr. Prem Pia. He'll be talking about his work with Indigenous languages in Nepal. Uh, so we hope to see you there. And thank you again so much, Dr. Kelly. We're, we're really grateful for you taking the time to share with us today. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Anna.